players are coming, players are going, they're signing contracts, they're getting traded. How can advanced statistics help us make sense of it all? Hi, I'm Rob, Rob Volman of the Sabre Metrics Network. Now today, I've got Justin Azevedo of Metrics and Gasoline and Flames Nation to help us make sense of it all. We're going to ask him what, uh, which advanced statistics he uses to make evaluations and maybe get some examples of some really good deals that he's seen so far this year and maybe some bad deals. Hi Justin, welcome. I, I was told there was supposed to be beer here, that's the only reason I came. I don't know. I've not seen any beer, but we'll move on. Continue. Okay, well, put, no. that, put that behind you. All right, I'll make a note right here. Beer. <laughs> put that right under your GBT. Okay. okay. So, uh, well, first of all, which advanced statistics do you find most useful when, you, uh, when you're evaluating a deal? Well, obviously, raw Corsi is an issue just because it doesn't have a lot of context with it. But Corsi on, I really like to see. Uh, relative Corsi isn't exactly, I, I don't like it as in terms of evaluating players from different teams because, obviously, different teams will generate or give up more shots towards the net uh, than another team will. So Corsi on, I really like seeing a player who's plus 15 or whatever. Um, when players can demonstrate they have a skill to create shots and create movement towards the net, I find that something is a very desirable trait. Um, low zone, zone starts. Uh, a guy with low zone starts I covet because you always have the players that can play like forward, or at least forwards at least. You always have forwards that can play forward and score goals. Finding guys you can just bury and you know have the defensive zone starts so you can have the guys that score goals have these have the upper hand on the uh, on the other team. Those guys are rare, and especially ones that can actually handle that res defensive responsibility well. Like you can bury any guy, but just because he's buried doesn't mean necessarily he's going to prevent shots against. And mm -hmm. some guys can do that, like Jamie Clements and Sammy Paulson. But well, I guess we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. <laughs> well, that is a nice segue to my my next question. Of all the deals you've seen so far, using Corsi and zone starts and any other stats. Uh, what are some examples of some of the best deals that you've seen so far this year? So the McClellan deal is one. Uh, Do you like the McClellan? Yes. You know what, he was using a relatively tough in his capacity last year in uh, Colorado, and you know what, seeing him go to Toronto, uh, maybe, maybe pissed me off a little bit, just because I really like him as a player, and you know, he seems to be able to take those tough starts and you know create room for other young guys, or I guess it will be, end up being Kessel and Lupul and whoever's centering that line this year. So that that will give those guys, Kessel obviously a 40 goal scorer last year or relatively mm -hmm. close to it, that will give those guys even more of a upper hand and maybe even produce more goals for the Leafs. Um, straying a bit from the Corsi thing, I actually really like the Tuka Rask deal. Really? Um, the four like young goalies that have signed this year, there's Pavlich, uh, uh, obviously Rask, Schneider, and uh, Dubnik and Edmonton. Yeah. When you look at Rask's contract compared to the other three guys, he's underpaid. Mm -hmm. Like the other three guys, all got somewhere in the neighborhood of four million dollars a year for two or three years, or Pavlich's case four or five. I can't remember. But Rask's being underpaid compared to those guys, and even though he has a longer, uh, longer sample or larger sample size of shots against, and he's performed better even strength than all those guys, anyways. Mm -hmm. but I think it's a really, not, a really nice job by Trelli to get essentially the best goaltender with the longest track record mm -hmm. under contract for cheaper than what other guys were being paid. Um, past those two, I, this is a real homer pick, but I really like my, uh, Michael Backlund's contract. Mm -hmm. the guy killed it on the underlines last year, uh, you know, had a sub-50 zone start, played really tough cop, uh, top six competition and had a relative course of like plus 14. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not saying much because the Flames sucked last year, but <laughs> his course on was still like plus five, which was yeah. far and away maybe two or three course events a game better than any other player on the team. So And they got him for a near league minimum. Yeah, I think seven seventy five. So yeah. that's I mean, a lot of that has to do with his uh, lackluster counting stats. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. He he's he looks to be in line for a, a bit of a lot correction this year. His on ice shot percentage last year was like three point five percent. Just historically bad. So hopefully as a Flames fan of sentence, hopefully he can, you know, maybe get that luck back, maybe bring the PDO up a little bit, but we'll see, I guess. So for good deals, uh, you like guys like Jay McClement, who are play a lot of the defensive zone minutes, so guys like next year it'll be Phil Kessel can get more offense opportunities to score a lot more goals, exactly. yeah. uh, and you got to get them for cheap. Or goalies like Tuka Rask, who are young, um, don't, have a lot of ex don't have a lot of game experience, but uh, have played very well in those game experience, yeah. and you're getting for a little bit less than you are the other goalies in the peer group. Or players like Mikhail Backlund, you're getting nearly minimum, 
but they have excellent coursey rates yeah. and uh, good defensive zone starts. And it has to do with more like the money puck, I guess, uh, view, yeah. of the, view of the game. And, I mean, eventually you are going to have to overpay for the players. It's kind of just the economy in the NHL right now. But I would rather you overpay for guys that score 30 goals a year than have to overpay for guys that allow those players to score 30 goals a year because those guys are a lot harder to flat. So on the flip side then, um, who paid too much? Like, Which of the deals strikes you <laughs> as too much of an overpay and perhaps are maybe some of the more confusing contracts for you stats-wise? So, not even just with the stats. I don't like term in contracts. Like, a lot of people look at the amount of money given up in contracts. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, 5.25 million, that's a huge amount of money for a second pairing defense. But, but for me, the issue is more the term. The way that the NHL has been you know, increasing the salary cap over the past five or six years since the lockout, looking at how much a $7 million contract is worth today, percentage-wise to the cap, and comparing on how it was when the cap was at 39.2 million or whatever the first year after the lockout, that the value, the value of the player really hasn't people people really haven't been able to recognize the fact that, you know, a three million dollar player in two thousand and five is the same as a five million dollar player nowadays, right. right? So for me it's more the term than anything. So that's why I really hate Parise and Sears contracts. Because I mean the, the cap hit is seven point five million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And I mean that's fine for guys that are 26, 27, 28. That's good. That's what those that's the age of those two guys. But to look at a thirteen year contract and then to determine that okay we know that they're probably not going to play all 13 years, but are we being, going to be able to get value, this kind of value, $7.5 million with the value of them for X amount of years? And I just don't really see that happening. Like, I think it's a 13-year contract, maybe six or five years they'll get of $7.5 million value. And then at that point, you're stuck with eight years left on the contract, and the Canucks are finding themselves with a long go too, mm -hmm. 10 years left on the contract. So while you're kind of compensating for the amount of money you're saving by giving them more term. The term is actually hamstringing you a little bit more than the money would. Mm -hmm. Because a uh, guy's on a one-year, $7 million, $7 million contract, even if he sucks the entire year, he's off the team, right? Um, so there's those two contracts I don't like. Uh, <laughs> the Weidman deal, um, not a huge fan of, uh, just because obviously the term is five years and the guy's 30 years old almost. Uh, we've watched the past few years with guys like Corey Sarge and uh, other unmentionables. Um, the how quickly play drops from those type of defensemen. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a little bit worried about that. And honestly, I think he provides maybe value to that contract for one year, depending on if the power player can actually. You know, he already actually demonstrates that the power you know, that he has a above average power play skills and helps the Flames uh, improve the power play. Um, other ridiculous deals. I don't know, what are some of the ones that you that you just absolutely hated? Well, well so far you mentioned uh, you look a lot at the term and the age of a player, and I, I agree with that too. I think that when you look at the term, um, I, I, I substitute the word risk. Like, instead of a four-year term, I just say a four-year risk. Okay, yeah. Um, that's, in fact, going back a year, and you want to talk to Calgary Flames, the Alex Tangay deal, because he signed until he's 37, and yeah. the odds of him continuing to play that well um, are low, and it's the Flames to take all that risk. Exactly. If Tangay just uh, gets worse with age, as happens to everyone except Ray Whitney, um, <laughs> then uh, then the uh, then the deal you know is great for Tangay. Uh, he's still getting paid the same money, but not so not so good for the Flames. Um, now, some people have been asking questions about uh, the Devin Dubnik deal. Do you want to talk about goalies? Talking about Rask being a good deal, Dubnik. Some people have said that that's an overpay. Uh, he got, uh, as I recall, three point five million. I think, I think for two years. For two years. Yeah. So at least it's not a risk, a lot of risk to it. But what do you think about the three point five million? So I'm actually a lot higher on Devin Dubnik than a lot of people. Uh, mm -hmm. His even strength save percentage has been relatively consistent over the past three years, and it's been a mid nine twenty save but even strength save percentage. So which is similar to Mika Kiprasov. It is actually. Yeah. I would even say better. I think I, I looked at Mika Kiprasov's uh, uh, past five or six years, uh, last year, last summer. I think like three of the years he was actually under threshold level goaltending at even strength save percentage. But um, looking at that deal in a vacuum, you know, actually I think that's probably around market value for a guy of Dunick's uh, save percentage acumen. Um, and this was another thing I was uh, I was reading. Uh, they were comparing him to Rask and Schneider over that uh, uh, over that like uh, past three years or whatever. These mm -hmm. all three of these goalies have played in the NHL, and Dunick actually comes up 
pretty well. He's got a large sample size of shots. I think it's pretty close to 2,800 now. Uh, I can't remember where, but around 3,000, I think, is kind of like the... It's like, okay, you know what? 3,000 shots. We're getting into a pretty good sample size for this goaltender because I think that's 100 games. So, um, so he's at about 2,600 shots, and he's demonstrated that he can stop the puck, which is good because Edmonton needs that. So I think there's definitely not a lot of risk, and if he does continue to get better, he'll... It's obviously an issue of failure because I have to pay him more than three point five million dollars. But for right now, I think I think that works for the Oilers. I think that works as a contract. Now, what about uh, what can the Winnipeg Jets expect from Ole Jokin? And he's getting paid four point five million, which is a fifty percent increase to what he was paid in Calgary, which some people already were suggesting was was uh, perhaps a bit more than he was worth. Four point. What can they expect from Ole Jokin? Well, you're going to expect a guy that. Was played in tough minutes last year. Mm-hmm. Wrongly played in tough minutes last year. He should have been a soft minutes centerman. Um, but he's probably going to be a second line guy that, if you use him correctly on the power play, can get you 50 points. But the issue is that I think throughout his career, people have seen, oh, you know, it's like 6'3. Oh, he's, he's the first line, the elite center that you can play the tough minutes. Cause you can't do that. Like, even when the Flames traded for him in 2009, I think, from the Coyotes, like, he had never really actually demonstrated that he could play top minutes. But people had always put him in that uh, situation. So I think depending on how the Jets line up, uh, depending on where Brian Little sits with the Jets, uh, if they keep that top line of Little, Ladd, and I can't remember who else. So Wheeler. Wheeler? Yeah. If they keep that top line together and they use Jokin as a second line center, With I think, that, and I think yeah. that if you can play those guys in the soft minutes, like a 60% zone start, and maybe give them third line competition, that's probably 50, uh, 60 points for the opening. But he's going to hit a lot of posts, and that's going to be frustrating. So there's always, there's also that. And what about David Moss? David Moss, you know what? When the guy's on the ice, he's on. Like, he is a good player. He moves the puck the right direction, has a positive course pretty much all the time, uh, plays really tough minutes. You can That's a type of guy that you can bury. But the issue is that he's always hurt. Mm-hmm. And it's not like... This past year it was his ankle, his right ankle, I think. The last year, the year before that was his left ankle, and the knees, and then chest. Like, the guy is just made of glass. So if he, but the forty games that he's on the ice per year, dynamite. So did you like the David Moss contract? <sighs> for the Coyotes, yes, but that's obviously I press that with, for the Coyotes because the Coyotes don't have a lot of money to spend, and they have to find good value deals. Mm-hmm. I think two million dollars or two point one million dollars for Moss even if he is only playing 50 games a season, is a good value deal for what he brings. Uh, he is that type of guy that you can bury, that you can give him the tough minutes, that he can push those, uh, push the players, like like Ray Whitney if they had re-signed him, uh, <laughs> to, to give like those types of guys good, uh, good high zone starts. See, Ray Whitney uh, brings me to uh, sort of my final question. Um, I'm always on the quest for, like you, for money puck players. Yeah. And in, in baseball, Moneyball was basically described as a player that has some sort of deficiency that scares other people away from seeing their true value. Yeah. You know, like perhaps the player's overweight, perhaps he had a history of injuries, perhaps he came off a bad season, perhaps he played in the Japanese league, perhaps he's tall or short yeah. or old or young. Ray Whitney is a good example. A lot of people don't see his value just because he's 40. And there's risk in there, but they overlook the value. So one of the guys I was looking at as terms of money puck player is also a little bit older. But he's also like uh, the Jay McClement player you mentioned, in the sense that he has a lot of defensive zone starts that makes his stats and makes him therefore undervalued. Mm-hmm. But he wins face-offs at a 58% rate, he kills penalties like a machine, and uh, he plays the defensive zone starts, which would give the players on his team, like the Phil Kessels on his team, a lot of extra opportunities to score. Mm-hmm. What do you think about someone signing Jeff Halpern? Oh, interesting. I guess, I guess it really depends on... You know, that, that's the type of player that I would love the Flames to sign, but obviously the Flames have quite an issue with the amount of uh, amount of people uh, they have uh, right now uh, in the forward ranks. Jeff Halpern, that's a really intriguing, uh, and it kind of reminds me of Marcel Gotch. Like last year, I was looking at uh, these those, those types of players, and I never really thought of Gotch as one of those types of players. And then you look at the stats, and you look at he's been consistent, and you know this, this, and this, and, all, and he performs pretty well in this. Halpern would be a good addition along the lines of a Jay McClellan type. Um, he would be a guy that you could bury in. It would create opportunities for other players. So I think that would, that would be, I don't know, I'd, I'd be willing to give him a two or three year contract, actually, even. Just because of, he, he seems to, I mean, I haven't, I mean, I haven't looked at it 
too in depth, but just based on prior looks at uh, um, Washington, no, whatever team he was on, I can't remember. Um, he has demonstrated that he has that acumen over a long period of time, long being like three years at this point. But but you wouldn't offer him a thirteen-year deal at ninety-eight million? Probably, you know? probably not. No. Probably a three-year, two-year deal, two and a half, maybe three million dollars. All right, well, thanks, Justin, for your thoughts. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching Sabermetrics Network. And now, if Justin has time, I'm going to see if I can entice him to a game of NHL 95. Let's do it. I've used the trade I'm feature ready. to reconstruct the 2012 All-Stars. <laughs> nice, so let's do it. You can play now? I'm ready to go. All right, catch you next time.